Our spiritual care ministry extends help to those walking through difficult times. Our trained peer discipleship team members can address various concerns, including spiritual, relational, grief, financial, or helping you find your next best step at Grace. We use prayer, mentoring, coaching, guidance, and professional referrals as tools of care. Our ministry is free, short-term, biblically-based, and confidential. We are not professional counselors. Referrals are given as needed. If you'd like more information regarding spiritual care, visit graceoc.com and click connect. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Glad to be here with you guys. Uh, Just like Pastor Mike said on that video there, if you're going through a hard time, if you're needing somebody to walk with you through your difficult season, we are here for you in that. And you can help us get connected with you there at graceoc.com slash spiritual care. My name is Jake. I get to be our campus director here at Grace uh, at Washingtonville. So great to meet you. So great to see you here today. And hey, if you're joining us online, thanks for being here wherever you're, uh, you know, tuning in from. Thanks for being here. For our folks in person, you'll notice some of our camera crew walking around a little bit, and that's so they're there so our folks online can have an awesome experience wherever they're joining us from today. So uh, thank you for being here. If you're a guest with us, thank you so much for choosing to be here, taking the time out of your day. We want you to know that you are a gift to us here at Grace, and you're a gift so much that we have a gift for you as a way to say thank you for being here with us today. So if you're new and you want to fill out that connection card in the seat back in front of you there, uh, we'll make a donation to a local charity in your name as a way to say thank you for being here with us today because it really does mean that much. So a few things you'll hear us say here at Grace, this is in the DNA of who we are as a church, as a community, as a people, is it's okay to not be okay here. Our hope is that we don't want to stay in that not okay place. I personally need this, and I know all of us do. I I love being able to say that about us as a church, that it's okay to not be okay because we all need that kind of place. Our hope is, is that we don't stay in that not okay place, and that leads me to say this, is that we love you enough to tell you the truth, and that is the capital T truth of Jesus Christ. We believe that whatever makes us not okay, that Jesus is the answer. So we love you enough to tell you about him, Today's going to be a great day. We have some great music. We have an amazing message. Uh, God has really blessed us today, and we want to look forward to what else is next. What's our next step with Jesus? So we want to get you connected into that, into that, and whatever that looks like for you. Help us do that by filling out a connection card, signing up there, saying that you have a next step. Uh, you can sign up for our weekly emails, and we'll let you know what's going on, and you can get plugged into the life of grace that way. You know, one last thing is, you'll notice we won't pass a plate or an offering basket here at Grace. We believe that giving is an intentional act of worship. So if you've come today prepared to give, you can place that one in the brown wooden boxes in the back of the room. You can give online uh, at graceoc.com. Or hey, if you're joining us online right now, there's a button there for you as well. So we have a great morning together. The band is ready. We're ready. Let's stand together. Lift your hands. uh, Stand on your feet. Let's lift our voices together. Thank you, Jake. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Andrew Materia. Candace and the band and I are excited to be here with you together this morning to worship. Let's lift up our voices and bring some joy and praise in this house this morning as we give God thanks for who he is, what he's done in our lives, and what he will continue to do. Amen. We sang this song last week, so as you remember it, lift your voices and sing. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. 
we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We're the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, let's There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be Shout out his praise this morning. He is worthy. He is our champion. His blood and his death on the cross defeated sin. And he fights our battles on our behalf. So whatever you're going through this morning, place your hope and place your trust and your faith in Jesus. He is for you. Let's sing together, lift up our voices, and declare the truth. God, you are our champion.
we are so grateful that you remain to be the champion in our lives. Even when things seem difficult, when things seem hard, God, we declare victory in your name, God, as you walk alongside us and you continue, continue to be with us. You live in us and we reside within you. God, we bless your name today. God, we ask that you will just open up our hearts and our minds to receive the word that you have prepared just for us. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for singing. Please have a seat. What's up, y'all? Thanks for coming out. Great to see you. And welcome all y'all right there online and at our campuses. Love you. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jared. Have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of these wonderful people known as Grace. It's such a joy to have you, our people, but also any guests that you're uh, joining us. Joy to have you as well. You're catching us in a series called Foundations. And what we've been doing for quite a while now is just following Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's about two chapters, two or three chapters. And just verse by verse, section by section, taking it for what it is and seeing what Jesus has to say to us. So we've already been through certain sections, and in the fall, we're going to tackle another section. But this, this journey has to do with some really tough truths from Jesus, uh, in which we are to wrestle with. He kind of holds us in the mirror and has us take a good look at ourselves and won't allow us to squirm our way out. And that happens to be one of those messages today. So let me pray, and we'll dig in. Lord, thank you for all gathered, and I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit will be our ultimate teacher. I pray you teach through your, through your servant, through your scriptures, and I pray that you would open every heart to be vulnerable and open to whatever you have to say to us through your word, even if it's difficult to hear. We need you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So I don't know what's on your television. I'll tell you what's on mine. All kinds of networks. We got Netflix. We got Peacock TV. We have Disney, Disney Plus. We have Apple TV, Apple TV Plus. We have Discovery, Discovery Plus. Anybody have these? And when we sit down as a family or I sit down with my kids to find something to watch, first of all, we got to figure out what network then we get into Netflix, and we got to figure out what we're going to watch in Netflix. Hundreds of choices, and we're, you get paralyzed just trying to figure out what you want to watch. We spend 30 minutes just trying to decide on what we're going to choose out of all these choices. So, so many choices that you and I could have could actually be unhelpful and even paralyzing. So that's why I love Jesus and his words here having to do with the foundation series because he makes it real simple. He doesn't bring us all kinds of choices that could confuse or bring, bring, uh, not bring clarity and make things muddy. He brings two choices so that we're not paralyzed, just two, life, death. That's your choice, to choose life or to choose death. So today we see that he offers two gates, two ways, two crowds, and two destinies. And we're going to see this today, and we're going to see this next week, and the next week, and following, as he offers these two choices, beginning with the gates here. So here we go, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So let's jump into the middle here and deal with this wide gate. As Jesus says, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. 
So let me give a bit of a preface, preface to this. We're going to hear some difficult truths. And I just want you to know my heart behind what we're about to hear. Uh, this message is for all who have gathered. Uh, I'm really thinking of the people of grace, people who call, them, call themselves Christians at grace, as I think of being the shepherd, the under-shepherd under Jesus, and trying to disciple and teach our people. Of course, this is for us all. As I'm talking about some difficult matters, I hope you know the heart of this pastor, all the love I have in me, all the compassion I have in me, all the respect I have in me is there, but I must preach the truth in love, but bring the truth as we see it from Jesus and how it's interpreted in scripture that can guide us. So here we begin with this wide gate, the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. Four marks to this broad gate. Are you ready? Yeah, you think you are. One person was ready at least, so we'll go with that. Four marks. Here's the first one. This gate is preferable. Everybody prefers this gate. Matter of fact, everybody is born in, through this gate. They're born onto this wide way, this broad road. Without Christ, that's where we all are. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's all. Scripture even says when we were conceived, we're conceived in sin. We're in a world of sin a sin nature. Then the apostle Paul picks it up and he's speaking to former unbelievers who are now Christians, reminding them of the broad way, the wide way they used to be on before they were born again. As for you, he writes, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, the wrath of God. So we have two goldfish at our house now named Gilbert and Dilbert. And they swim around in our bowl and they're so happy. They swim. It's, you know, we have to have the temperature a little bit warm for them. And they swim. It's so accommodating, so comfortable, so familiar. And that's the wide road. That's what's accommodating. That's what's familiar. That's what's comfortable. That is the, that's why everybody is born there. That's why everybody prefers this wide gate, this wide road. And many don't even notice that there's death coming, physical death. And there is very little thought of one's eternal destiny, whether it will be life or whether it will be destruction. So that's the wide road. Are you on the wide road, on the wide way, in the wide gate? Because it's preferable, because it's wide. And then secondly, the second mark of this gate, this wide way, is also that it's inclusive. It's easy, easy, it's easy. Uh, the way is easy that leads to destruction, Jesus says. Think of a parade is a wide road with a big parade. And down that parade is, uh, in that parade is plenty of room. Whatever views you hold, there's room for it. Whatever religion you believe, there's room for you. Whatever ideologies you hold, space. Whatever beliefs you have, whatever lifestyle you live, all are accepted. All are the same in God's eyes. Because after all, God is love. And he is love, very much so. But do you see the context as well about who God is? Not that he's only love. And around that often are the words, well, all religions are the same. All beliefs are the same. Everybody is saved in the end. If you believe that, if you believe people are saved and there's a heaven, everybody gets to heaven. In other words, you hear of God, the God of love, but you never hear that God has wrath. You never hear that there is a hell. You don't hear, for, hear about judgment or sin or repentance or death. You don't, you don't hear that. You don't believe that. After all, that's not God. That's right. That's what you would believe because that's the easy road. That's the inclusive road. It's the whisper of the serpent to Adam and Eve when God said, do this, don't do that. And then the serpent showed up and said, did God really say? And the serpent also said to them, you will not surely die. That's the message, the serpent's message on this, on this way. 
So all are inclusive. It's all inclusive here. So if you want to worship nature as your connection with God, then go for it. There's plenty of room. You're, you're right with God in that. Or if you believe if you keep most of the commandments, then God must accept you. Good. You're welcome on that road. There's plenty of room. If you believe you're a Christian and can live like hell and still go to heaven, well, you fit there too. That's a good space for you. If you believe in a gospel called prosperity, which means if I have enough faith, God's going to make me healthy and wealthy. That's the point. Well, there's room for you as well. If you believe in critical race theory or critical queer theory, there's room for you as well. Also, if you believe in crystals and spirituality and palm readers and horoscopes, welcome. Welcome. You're invited to the parade. Or if you believe that God just, in the end, loves all, all will be made right with him. Or if you want to sleep around with whomever you want outside of marriage or commit adultery and it's just who you are. If you want to be a witch too, welcome to you as well. If you want to be a Muslim, you want to be a Jew, you want to be a Jehovah's Witness, plenty of room. If you want to jump in and wave flags or show signs or wear t-shirts, all are welcome because this is an inclusive, easy road. Sure is quiet in here. And I understand. Here's what I think. So when I was in Alabama growing up, teenager, these were in my pre-Christ years. Can I just leave it there with me and my buddies? So we did some outlandish things, but even my buddies kind of went too far. We have a little hometown newspaper as well, and I'd kind of thumb through it, and something showed up in an article that I'll mention here in a moment. But I was over at a buddy's house. We walk into his bedroom, and he has a big stop sign, road signs all around his room, danger ahead, hazard signs. And I didn't think a whole lot about it, and so I thought he was picking them up maybe at a yard sale or something. Then I went to another buddy's house. We walked into his room, and he had these big street signs as well. And then when I read an article in the newspaper about a week later, it was an article about road signs being stolen around our little town. Now, I'm no rat, so I didn't write my buddies out. But I did have a bit of a conversation with them. I mean, even not as a Christian, I knew that was wrong. And I was like, what are you, bro, what are you doing? Taking a stop sign, somebody can pass through that and be killed. Taking a danger ahead sign, removing that, somebody can be hurt. The wide road has no signs. There's no stop sign. There's no danger ahead sign. There's no hazard sign. It's just everybody parade. There's room for everybody. Actually, it's worse than that. There are signs, but you're blinded to it because 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelievers where they don't see the signs. So are you on the wide road and you don't see the signs, especially from Jesus as we're about to see? But that is the wide way. It's preferable, Jesus says, because it's wide. It's inclusive of all because it's easy. And then thirdly, it's popular because many, many are on it. It's popular. You know, I've determined at this point in my life, and this is how I teach and bring up my kids, that whatever celebrities are championing and celebrating, you can bet that's the wide road. That's the wide way. Social influencers and what they're saying, pretty good notion of that's the wide way. Whatever the mass media is celebrating or not reporting, you can pretty much guarantee that's a wide space. Whatever universities are propagating and what it's doing to students, you can pretty much guarantee that is the popular wide way that leads to death. You hear words like this on the, right, on the, on the wide path, on the wide way. You hear words like this. Well, that's my truth. You have your truth, that's your truth. But I have my truth, and that's my truth. You hear words like, well, love is love. Everybody just love, let them love, love is love. Or this is my authentic self, this is your authentic self, we just need to pursue our authentic self. Or it's my body, who are you to tell me? It's my body, it's my choice. Or it's, I can do whatever I want as long as it doesn't hurt others. Do you know where that kind of language came from? It came during the sexual revolution of I can do whatever I want, sleep with whom I want, as long as it do doesn't hurt others. And have you looked at the statistics lately? There's a lot of hurt, 
a lot of damage, a lot of brokenness, a lot of regret, because these don't pan out in reality. In this, on this road, this popular road, what you find there is that feelings are truth. My desires are truth. Even if science goes against it, then it's untrue. It's my desires that are true. It's my feelings that are true. And truth is discovered in my life if it justifies my desires. It's this big phrase called expressive individualism. I'm going to write on this probably on my blog in the next few weeks. Basically, that's just a big word that says this about this road. I look inside of me to define myself and then I pursue my deepest desires. And whatever I go inside of me to define myself and pursue my deepest desires, that is truth. To which I would say as your pastor, is that truth? Or is that the wide way? <clears throat> Let's see what the scriptures say about it through the apostle Paul. <clears throat> Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men and women who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. See that word there, unrighteousness of men and women, mentions it twice. That's, of course, righteousness that it's countering. Righteousness is not just faith. It means the right way of understanding reality and life and God's order, and God's creation, right living. The Apostle Paul also writes, <clears throat> for although they knew God, made in his image something transcendent within us, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. That is sobering, because Jeremiah the prophet has said already, that our hearts are desperately wicked and sick. And then we have the Apostle Paul saying, to think we can go inside of our feelings and our desires for our truth is actually rebellion. And it brings this darkness in thinking, a futility and foolishness and darkness within the heart. Just that text right there, you, you, you want to know where, why mass shootings happen? Why sexual and domestic abuse happens? why racism happens, why sexual perversion happens and abortions happen. You know how? You know, just look at that text and you see why. It's, it's a theological, spiritual, biblical reality that shows us that's where it all goes wrong. Unrighteousness, suppressing the truth, futile in thinking, foolish hearts darkened. Mm. Then you go to Romans chapter 1, verse 24, and many kind of sinful behaviors he mentions from greed to gossip to hate with a glaring indictment there in three, with three, four verses condemning homosexuality. Then you get to Romans chapter one, verse 30, and I'd never really, this verse hit me in a way that I've never seen it before in light of this message. And here's what it says, Romans chapter one, verse 30. They invent ways of doing evil. They invent ways of doing evil. Think about that. Is it just me or, what, or do you think, how can we keep inventing ways of doing evil? How does that even happen? Maybe this. Would you have believed five years ago that on your phone you would find an emoji of a pregnant man? Would you have believed five years ago, ladies, that you are now starting to be called birthing people? What happens? What happened? Suppressing the truth unrighteousness, foolish hearts, darkened, inventing ways of evil. The Apostle Paul goes on to say this, <clears throat> though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So what we've heard through these verses is the wide gate, the wide way that is easy. And the word to sum it up in these verses is rebellion. This is the height of rebellion against God. That's why words like the wrath of God is being revealed. 
And the wrath of God, if you keep on reading that section, I just didn't have a time. It's such a big section. Go read it for yourself. The wrath of God is not fire, hell, and brimstone here. The wrath of God is giving you over to you. No more conviction. No more drawing you to himself. Just gives you over to your lust, your desires, your feelings, and your lifestyle. He leaves you alone. That's wrath. And here it says, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And this where a pastor over his people says, Christian, are you giving approval to what society and the culture celebrates, champions, applauds? Are you giving approval to rebellion against God? I came across this article, and I think it hits home for us. I read this article, and I thought, oh, this is going to preach one day. It's uh, how ants in certain climates will walk around their path, and they pick up fungal spores, a fungus. And it begins to get into the ant. And the ant lives its life. Everything's okay. But slowly what's happening is the, the spores of that fungus begin to fill the ant, start taking control of it without it really even noticing it. And then in time, the spores go into the ant brain, begins to control the ant, ultimately driving the ant to destruction, to its death. And I wonder how many Christians have allowed the fungal rebellion of our society and culture to get into your bloodstream, to get into your bones, to get into your mind, and it's driving you to the death. It's not of God. But that's the wide way. It's the popular way. It's the easy way. That's what Jesus says. So it's a way that's preferable. It's wide. It's a way that's inclusive. It's easy. It's a way that's popular because there are many on it. And then finally, it's death. It's death. Wide is the way that leads to destruction. Proverbs 16, 25. There is a way that seems right to a person, society, culture, but its end is the way of death. So two ways in rebellion against God, there can be death. It could be a disintegration or it can be eternal destruction. So what I mean by disintegration is this. God created and he created order. Genesis 1 and 2, God created man, woman. He created male, female. He created man and woman to leave father and mother and be united as man and woman, procreate, and so forth and so on. That's God's order, and there's more. So what we see in Scripture, if you go against God's order, ultimately, God's order goes against you. So I tell my, my kids about this. I said, if, you, if you're ever confused, if you're ever if things are murky and not clear and you're, you're not, you don't understand, go back to creation. Go back to Genesis 1 and 2 and see what God did. Because the prophets pointed back to God's creation. Jesus pointed back to God's creation. The apostle, Paul, pointed back to God's creation to be the root, to be the anchor, especially in the sway of the wide way. So to go against God's order, God's order will go against you. So for example, are Gilbert and Dilbert swimming around their little freshwater pole, uh, uh, bowl? If I took that water out and put in their salt water, well, they'll drop in and they'll swing, swim like happy little fish for a while. But slowly they're dying because the order in which they were created was to be in fresh water. But if I go against that order and put them in salt water, they will disintegrate from within. Same way for those of us paying $100 for our gas now in our vehicles, I'm pretty sure you don't want to drive up to the gas station and put diesel in your car by accident. Because if you put diesel in your car that runs on unleaded gas, you'll discover you have gone against the order in which the car was made. It was made for gas, not for diesel. So if you put diesel in it, it's going to disintegrate. Why would God be any different? He has created life and order for flourishing, in his, for his glory, in his image. So to go against that order means your desires, your heart, your thinking disintegrates until you think it's real and it's true. 
and you've lost touch with reality. And reality is found right here. This is a book of re- it's a book of God, and it's a book of reality and the way God is created. And it's death to go get. So let's look at what let's look at what James says here. He says, "Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God." For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. You can also read it this way. Let no one say, God made me this way. Because God has made us all the same. He made us in his image with dignity for his glory and for flourishing in his order. So for anyone to say, no, God made me this way, that's foolish thinking. Because God makes us for himself and his glory. If something's askew, thinking God made me this way, not God didn't do that, sins made you that way. Sin meaning you and I were conceived at birth in sin. We have a sinful nature. Sin wrecks everything. That's where you have mental illness. That's where you have cancer. That's where you have broken desires that will mislead you to the death. So that's why you come back to the truth of Scripture to align ourselves in what God has for us. James keeps going. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives, brings forth death. So my kids, so Josiah is 18. He's driving around my son Titus, he's 16, so we're in the parking lots right now. We're trying to, trying to teach him how to drive the car. And, and so what I tell them, I said, you know, you're going to be on the road one day and fog's going to come out of nowhere and you're going to, things are going to get really murky and unclear and, and or a storm can show up and it can be really overwhelming or somebody comes around the curve and the bright lights are in your eyes and you're going to lose, lose yourself for a minute. I said, here's what you do. Whenever that happens, just look down at the line. That line right there, you just stayed right on that line and, and you just keep going, you know, unless you pull over, but you follow the line and that'll keep you on the straight, narrow way. So in the same way, when things get really murky, especially from other Christians who approve or, or, Christi- or the worst Christian pastors or influencers or bestsellers, when they start making things really murky around truth and scripture, you got to go to the scripture to get on the line and follow the line. Hmm. It's also death in terms of eternal death. So let me just go with Jesus here. Jesus says next week that there are bad trees and good trees with fruits, bad fruit, fruits and, and good fruits. The bad tree with the bad fruit goes into the fire. That's hell talk. Jesus also says in Matthew chapter 13, there are going to be wheats and tares. And what's sobering about this is that the tares actually think they're wheat. But the tares will go into the eternal fire where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's Jesus' words. And then there's this passage. And I'm going to tell you, I almost didn't include this passage. It's so overwhelmingly heavy. But often I've realized when, I, when I'm considering not adding something, I should add it. Because maybe God has a purpose for it. So here it is for what it's worth. Revelation chapter 14.10 is, is the way as we know it begins to climax. He says, they, the unbelievers too, will drink the wine of God's fury, who has been poured out, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the lamb. That's where the rebellious go. Because ultimately, it's unbelieving in Christ. What gives me shivers down my spine was those last two words. The lamb. The lamb's present in hell? Yeah, because the lamb is God. And hell is God minus mercy. God minus love. You had every opportunity here to repent of rebellion and turn to him. And this is the moment where it's too late. And that's why you'll hear me often say that for those who believe outside of Christ in the messages of society and the culture and the easy way to believe that in this life with the next life to come forever 
is a long time to be wrong. So would you rather listen to the deconstructed faith Christian and what he says? Would you rather listen to the celebrity and what they're championing or the social media influencer? Would you rather listen to your own desires and feelings? Or could I encourage you to go here to the Bible that deals with reality, deals with eternal death and eternal life? And maybe even trust your pastor a little bit. Double check. Be sure I'm on pace. You got to do that because I'm, I'm a human being. I can mess this up. But I think you'll find we're on the same page with this. So are you on this wide way? That's preferable because it's wide. It's inclusive because it's easy. It's popular because there are many, but it's death because they're destruction. Now let's go to the narrow road. Whew. The narrow way, the narrow gate. Here's what Jesus says. Enter by the narrow gate for the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. Here we find four marks to the narrow gate and the narrow way of Jesus. First of all, it's exclusive, exclusive. How so? It's hard to find. There are a few that find it. How is it hard to find? Because it's so hard to accept. I know for many under the sound of my voice, this is so hard to accept what you're hearing today, and I get it. But that's proof what Jesus is saying is true. It's hard to find because there's so many choices. There are so many beliefs. There's so many religions. There's so many ideologies and lifestyles and desires. Surely not. But here's what Jesus says, John 10, 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Jesus doesn't say I'm one of the gates. He's saying I'm it. You want to see God? You come through me alone. No other religion saves. No spirituality saves. Nothing, no ideology, nothing, no one saves but Jesus. It's exclusive Luke 13, Jesus says this, or it says this happened with Jesus. Someone said to Jesus, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, agonize, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. There are many who live their lives thinking they're going to go to God. Many who call themselves Christians and they're not. And they're going to show up one day wanting to go through the narrow gate, but they never trusted me. They rebelled, and this is where their rebellion led them, not to be able to enter. Then Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. God gives no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Keywords, no other name. Not the name of Allah, not Joseph Smith, those, the cult, uh, I forgot if it's Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness, one of those. No other name, only the name of Jesus. Here's the thing. So I read this, I think I've shared this before. I read this article years ago about these mountaineers going up Mount Everest. And these couple of gentlemen, they fatigued out, uh, very cold, and they collapsed, and they were laying there. Well, one of them got down to tell the story, but his friend died. Here's how his friend died. As they were sitting there full of uh, all, all the gear on them and, and, and trying to stay warm, all of a sudden, his friend became overwhelmingly hot, like so hot he couldn't stand it. So he began to peel off all the layers of his clothes to get rid of him. And of course, with no clothes, he quickly succumbed to the cold. So think about that story for a minute. What he felt, felt so true. It felt so right. But the truth was, the truth is, he believed what he felt was right, but not what was right. And to believe what feels right versus what is not right is fatal, eternally fatal. So that's why we align back to Jesus' exclusive words that what feels good or what feels true may not be. But here's how you can know the truth, Jesus the Jesus of the scriptures and all the scriptures. So are you on the exclusive road? It's exclusive. If you find it, secondly, it's a way that's confining. It's confining. I love that Jesus just makes that clear. To be a Christian, you, you're gonna, your life is going to be limited. It's going to be confined because you just can't believe whatever you want. You can't just live any way you want when you become a follower of Jesus, born again. Confined. You know what confined is? 
I don't know, maybe it's just me. I've hit this age now where there's certain things I try to go through. I got to do one of these. You ever done that? You ever had to pull in the gut and try to fit through the doorway or the turnstile or something? That's the picture I have is there's some things we got to pull back out of our lives to be able to enter to this narrow gate. And one of it has to do with beliefs. Doctrine is the big word. God's will, God's word. Do you follow God's word? Do you believe God's word? The Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. You have known the holy scriptures he says to Timothy, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Not just training in faith, but in righteousness, right way of viewing reality, right way of seeing truth, God's order, God's creation, what's Evil, what's not evil, or redefined is good when it's really evil. All this, you need God's word in that training of understanding in your heart and and mind, as I do. So you could think of it this way. If If you're not in God's word, how do you navigate the world? How do you not succumb to the world? How do you not start buying into the messages of the broad wide way. Important the scriptures here. And it sounds really fundamental. You know, I've been called a fundamentalist preacher. And some of you under your breath right now are like, amen. (laughs) Fundamentalist preacher, fundamentalist pastor, fundamentalist church. And you know what? I like that. And you know why I like that? Because if you play a sport, you got to learn the fundamentals. If you don't learn the fundamentals, you're never going to be very good at the sport. If you play a, if if you're a musician, you got to learn the fundamentals of music or you're never going to be the musician you want to be. And if you become the athlete and the musician and you begin to forget the fundamentals, you'll begin to fall apart. So in the same way, it's good to know the fundamentals, to preach the fundamentals, to live by the fundamentals. I love G.K. Chesterton says, he says, you know, the Christian life is restraining, but this, he says, the Christian life is also where good things run wild. My kids used to jump around on a trampoline, had a blast. I'd get on there with them too. Couldn't walk for two days afterward, but I'd get on there. But the, but the, especially for dad, thank God that the trampoline had this net around it. So it can find us to not hurt ourselves really, or to go flying off and kill ourselves. We had our fun right there. We were protected. We were confined to have joy and laughter and flourish. Welcome to the way of Christ. Welcome to the narrow way. That's what God's intended. Listen to Jeremiah 6, 6, 16 here. This is what the Lord says. This is the prophet Jeremiah again. He says, stand at the crossroads, life or death, and look, ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. If you look at all the new venting ways of evil, even the new messages out there, the new broad ways and doesn't it seem that the ancient paths are better because I look at the havoc and the violence and the destruction and the outrage and the hatred and I go back and say no the prophet's on to something look for the ancient paths the scriptures to follow those ways if you have a train and it's on rails tell me Is the train more free on the rails or is it more free off the rails and into the swamp? So the train confined to the rails, limited, restricted to the rails, flourishes to be a train. It flourishes to be everything it was made to be. So in the same way, God shows us through the scriptures through doctrine that these rails in which we live our lives is where you and I flourish. Good things run wild. We live up to the potential in which he's made us. So we can't just believe anything we want. And you and I, we can't just live any way we want. It's the turnstile. You know, you know the turnstile, right? You walk through the turnstile and the thing goes behind you. You know what I'm talking about? You can't bring things through the turnstile. You got to let some things go. So, for example, listen to this. Matthew chapter (laughs) 5, Jesus says, 
And let me remind you, I'm quoting Jesus. If your, hand, your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And here's what he says. Because it's better for you, for us, it's better for you to go to heaven lame than to go to hell whole. So, now he's not, nobody take out the ax when you get home, all right? He, what he's, he's talking about being ruthless with sin, being ruthless with it. Get it out of your life. Then the apostle Paul picks this up in Romans 6 and really brings it home for us. Watch this. Sin must no longer rule in your mortal bodies so that you obey the desires of your natural self. Nor must you surrender any part of yourselves to sin to be used for wicked purposes. Instead, give yourselves to God. There's the joy and the flourishing as those who have been brought from death to life and surrender your whole being to him to be used for right, righteous purposes. So are you on the are you on the narrow way, the narrow gate? Because one, it's exclusive. It's hard to find. Secondly, it's confining. I mean, it's hard to enter. The gate is narrow. And thirdly, it's hard. Jesus says this is a hard way to live. It's a hard way to life because of the, how we're wired to sinful nature and in the climate in which we live. So we're, what Jesus is showing us here is that you and I, you can't just live any way you want. You can't just believe anything you want. You can't approve of anything you want. You can't celebrate anything you want or participate in whatever you want. It's a hard way of life. That word hard means the pressing of juice out of grapes. Anybody ever felt like that as you tried to live out your faith, born again in Christ and righteousness? Jesus knew this. So there, first of all, it's personally hard. Watch. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny their desires deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That's deny your sire, desire. Deny where you seek to find your identity. Deny your identity. Deny those desires you seek to have truth in your life and follow the truth, who is Jesus. And it does mean taking up your cross, doesn't it? It's very difficult. It's very hard. So it's personally hard, and Jesus is honest about that. Secondly, it's relationally hard. Matthew 10, Jesus says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Whew. You know, I, I've read that in the past thinking, well, he's just talking about faith. He's talking about those who believe in Christ and those who don't. No, he's talking about a lot more than that. It's those who approve what you want to prove. Sword. Those who celebrate what you refuse to celebrate. Sword. Those who participate what you will not participate in. Sword. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me, Jesus says, is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is how important it is to follow Christ and his truth. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. It's personally hard to follow Christ and his truth and God's order. It's relationally hard. And then finally, it's culturally hard. 2 Timothy 3 says that the godly will be persecuted. Then Jesus, Matthew 5.10 says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of faith, because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, righteousness. God's order, God's creation, scripture, Jesus. Matthew 5.11, blessed are you when people insult you. That's happening. It's coming will persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you. That's what people on the broad road do to the people on the narrow road. Matthew 5, 12, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. 
For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <laughs> Sometimes I've been approached about, Pastor, what, you know, it sounds like you're just really being divisive. And I go, Have you read the Old Testament? Have you read the prophets? The prophets stood up at risk to their lives preaching against the sexual immorality of the day, of the idolatry of the day. And when you live a prophetic life, it's coming for you, if not already, this persecution. I came across a story about Athanasius. That sounds like a good goldfish name, doesn't it? Athanasius. <laughs> Athanasius was an old 4th century pastor, preacher, philosopher, so he got involved into this controversy regarding Christ and that Christ was the only way to heaven and, and uh, the deity of Christ. Let me be sure I read this right. So he had people come around. He lost a lot of friends, lost, lot, lost a lot of people that walked away from him because of his unpopular stance, was isolated. Finally, some of his friends circled back and they said, you need to give up your stance on this. Athanasius, because the whole world is against you. You know what his reply was? Then it's Athanasius against the whole world. And that's about what it means to be a Christian today. It's to live according to God's order, God's creation, following Christ the narrow way and trusting him that he will reward in his good time. So are you on the narrow way? Because it's exclusive, it's confining, it's hard. But finally, it's life. It's life, narrow and hard way that leads to life. And it's life now. Watch this, John 10. Jesus says about himself, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and they will go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Life of flourishing, a life of, of, of joy, a life of meaning, a life where you cry, but you have a smile underneath still because you know the Lord is for you, not against you. It also means life eternal. John 17, 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's what Jesus is saying about himself. And then John right there becomes Pastor John over his congregation later in 1 John 5, which he writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know how you can know you have eternal life today? That you believe in the name of the Son of God. That's the only way to heaven, Jesus. So thank God, I'm grateful that we're not faced, that Jesus didn't give us a, a, a you know, thousands of choices like Netflix and Discovery and all of that. He, two, two choices, two. Life, death, life, death. And then just for good measure, Jesus says about himself, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So let me end this sermon by reading Deuteronomy 30, 19, and we'll pray. This day, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you. I, that I have set before you today life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. And that's exactly what Jesus said at the very first. So what's your response today? Choose life. How? First words of Jesus, enter, 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 enter the narrow gate, enter the narrow way and follow him. Lord, we love you. We need you. I'm sweating up here, but I pray that with all my heart, it, it, whatever was of my flesh falls to the ground. I pray whatever was wrong of my tone, it would fall to the ground. I'm just a preacher yelling fire <laughs> get out of the get off the road it's fire it's danger ahead stop there's no stop sign there's, there's, oh God and so I give these precious people to you I give this hard message to you 
as I give it to them and I pray that this is a day that many will have their eyes opened, no longer blinded to see that you are worthy and you are worth it, our Savior, our hope, our life, our salvation. So forever, God, stir our hearts to run to you, run out of the run out of our desires, run out of our feelings, run out of our society and culture to run to you, our truth, our way, our life, our refuge. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know about you guys, but I want to choose life today. Would you stand with us and join as we close our time together in worship? We declare, God, that we will run after you, that our hearts and our minds and our eyes will be focused away from our ways into your ways, to the path you laid before us. So turn your eyes and your hearts to him. And join us together as we sing. God, forever we run to you.
Pastor Jared said, it's good news today knowing that Jesus has prepared this path and he's calling us to follow him on it, on this narrow path. And maybe today you're here and you're saying, I have not been walking that path. I've taken the broad path. I've been following my desires and been letting my emotions lead me. And you're wondering how to get back to that path. First of all, I want you to know that repentance is real and an option for you today. You can give your life to Jesus, turn back to him turn back to the path today. And maybe you don't even know what that's going to look like for you. Like, what is that next step for you in your life? Well, we want to walk with you in that. And so uh, myself and our Next Step director are going to be right outside those doors after service. We want to walk with you, pray with you to help you see what your next step is on the narrow path. You know, and if you're here and you just need some prayer, we're going to have some people up here to pray with you after service. But God bless you guys. I hope you have a great day and we will see you all next week. Have a good one, everybody.